Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Daisy Garcia. Um, this month, November, is Native American Heritage Month, and with us today, we're um, if you would like to go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, Chester Brown, we'll begin yes. with you. Okay. Um, my name is, of course, Chester Brown Jr. I do have a cultural name, um, which is Hashikaitkania, uh, or in, in in the words of of the the English ways, is the one who joined the elders. Okay. And so you basically introduce yourself that way in the Navajo way, and then you talk about your four clans, your mother's clan, your father's clan, your grandfather's clan, that's your mom's dad, and then your father's father. So you introduce yourself that way. So how I came about um, came about this is uh, over the last, I don't know how many years, I've been practicing the, the Navajo culture as well as the Pan-American Indian culture. Um, so some of that is Lakota, some of that is um, Kiowa. There's certain other other uh, things that came from uh, from the different tribes that I practice. Well, so it, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'll go along a little further in a little bit. Thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to touching more on that. Uh, Dr. Anderson, can you go introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, I'm Dr. J. Hugh Anderson. I'm a history instructor at Tarleton State University, and um, I've written a, a dissertation on the environmental history of, of North Central Texas, and that included several elements about uh, American indigenous people in that North Central Texas area. So I'm looking forward to talking with you a little bit about American Indians and uh, the role of the environment. Thank you. Um, Chester, can we begin talking about your day-to-day -day life on a reservation? Sure. Um, I'll have to start probably in uh, in 1966. Um, my father and my mother were were in a program that moved them to Denver, Colorado, for training. So uh, I was born in Denver, Colorado, and then I was then um, after they completed their certifications and training, uh, we moved back. We moved back to uh, north of Gallup, New Mexico community called Twin Lakes. So we moved there and um, my father um, worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs Roads Department. And uh, we made we made over enough money to not get any help. So we didn't get any assistance. So what that did was that put us into sort of poverty, I guess. So so my daily life from the time I could I could haul water a five gallon bucket it was in fifth grade. So I had to haul um, 15 gallons of water every day to bring back to the house. And then during the winter times, I had to chop um, two arm loads of wood to keep us warm at night. So part of that was preparing for the winter. Part of that was daily life. And then it was always about my 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 role as a male was always to take care of the stuff that was outside. Mm -hmm. So anything that had to do with outside, whether it was chopping wood, hauling water, taking care of the sheep, take, taking care of the horses and the cows, that was all on me. Um, so taking out the trash, burning it, and then and then somewhere along the way, we moved from this from this we moved into this house. I think it was in the seven like seventy, I think it was, and. Um, that's when things change because now we've got siblings. <laughs> so when the siblings showed up, um, everything changed for me because now I no longer was the only one. And how that changed my life was it, it made it a little more, um, I had to be more responsible in terms of what I was doing every day, how I was, how we were preparing for winter, how I was helping grandma and grandpa. And uh, we didn't have any electricity growing up on the reservation. So we didn't have any running water or electricity probably until grandma allowed us to plug in an extension cord into her trailer and run that extension cord uh, to our house so we could have some light and enjoy a little cubicle TV that was about that big, black mm -hmm. and white. Um, so all, all of the things that, that, um, I guess my 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 classmates had 
when I was growing up, I, I didn't have any of those things. I didn't know I didn't know what they were, but everything was about getting up early, um, getting up early, doing the chores, um, and then just really kind of making sure that I was presentable for school, for a community event, for anybody that's going to walk through that door. So it was all about hygiene. It was all about taking care of yourself. And even the way you dress, I mean, it, it, it got that far where it's like, okay, now you're going to have to put your, you put your socks on first on this side and then go on this side and then put your, put your pants on this way first and that and all the way up. So everything was kind of ceremonial mm-hmm. in that way. And um, so then at some point, I think it was 1973 when I was eight years old, um, this blanket behind me uh, was given to me uh, during a ceremony. So participating in that ceremony, um, this was the blanket that was given to me to to use in that ceremony. And the thing about, about growing up on the reservation, um, I had no idea what, what I was missing out on. Because I I had um, I had toys I had I had sticks that I used to play with um, I didn't I didn't know what it just basically was okay I get up in the morning I do my stuff make sure the sheep have water the cows the horses um, got to make some time to chop wood got to make some time to haul water and then at some point I think I was ten when I actually got my first job so then I had to balance school job chores. But all of it was just all done in a flowing motion. And then somewhere along the way, I picked up running. And Indian running is something that's very sacred. And once that once that took over, <laughs> my life changed. Because at that moment, it was now relationship to the earth, relationship to the, to the four elements, the earth, air, the fire, the water. Um, everything that you do, everything that you are, what you eat all these things become really important up to that point. So when I started running, that's when life changed for all of us as a family, because I had four sisters at that point. And um, my, the sister next to me, she went to, she went to the, to the Christian school that we were, we both, we both got to go into. So talk about balancing, you know, your Navajo traditional cultural ways with, um, with Christianity. Um, so part of that was Sunday school started, um, soon after that, uh, that went on from, I guess, 73 to 1984. Um, and I never became a member of that church. And I asked the pastor, I said, why? He goes, well, he says, your parents don't come. I go, oh, (laughs) okay. Got it. I didn't know there was, but I'm here anyway, you know, (laughs) doing my stuff. And then, and then it's like. So then he says, well, well, what do you think about that? I said, well, I went to one ceremony when I was, when I was eight and, and I got a name and I got invited to be part of the community right away. I said, and he looked at me, he's like, oh, <laughs> which is kind of like I was already part of the community because I went to this one, one time. And then I did it three, three times up to the point when I was in, in uh, junior high. And then the last time when I was in grad school. So what that does is that teaches you how to how to talk about where you come from. So I have to talk about my mother, my father, the clans people in the in the in the community that I grew up in. And then that way people can know who you are. So I used to I used to introduce myself with the clans where I grew up, who my parents were, um, the community I grew up in, and then the elders. So once I named the elders of that community, they already knew who I was. So so those are leaders in the community that are part of government, that are part of um, a cultural uh, medicine men, those kind of things. So that's that's how that's how it kind of all came about. And at some point along the way, I was actually um, invited to some of these some of these ways and learning about them. Just meant sitting down and and observing and listening, and at some point, at some point when they felt like that you 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 knew you kind of have an idea, then they hand the reins over to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it it was a fun time. I had a really good time growing up on the on the reservation. Um, 
is an experience. Um, the rites of passage was definitely a different one for me. Um, so the rites of passage was primarily going through that little ceremony. I think it was the third one I did is when we did the rites of passage, and that's when the horses were running um, at the end of that ceremony. So it kind of it kind of gives you a different perspective in terms of your role and your responsibility. And then growing up in a in a in a Christian school, there's certain things that that I couldn't I couldn't share. Certain things I couldn't say. There's certain things that um, I couldn't talk about in terms of my experience because on one side you have stories about Moses and and uh, the miracles that he did, and then and then you go back to the reservation and you see the miracles that are happening right there. Uh, so it's kind of like, uh, what do I am I able to share? I'm like, so so my father would say, no, don't 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 share it. It's, that's mm -hmm. that's between you and the creator. And I'm like, okay, got it. So as life went along, it was mostly. Um, learning how to pick up the, the the language, because my parents spoke Navajo to each other, but when it came to us, <laughs> they spoke English to us. <laughs> so, so it took me uh, it took me quite a long time to to pick it up, and once I picked it up, I never 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 I can talk with elders um, that don't know any English and. And sit down on them and have a good conversation about, I don't know, whatever they want to talk about. Usually it's horses and the government and water and how someone took my sheep. <laughs> I mean, <it's> <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's definitely interesting for sure. It was good though. It's really good because the situations and the circumstances in the 70s um on into the 80s uh, were, were pretty mild in 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 north northwest new mexico there wasn't a lot of turmoil so around what age um did you move off of the reservation well i graduated from high school in may 1984 and i received a a, a suit bag and uh two suitcases which kind of was the message that I was going to go. <laughs> oh. I do want to come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to um, let Dr. Anderson um, talk about our local history. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was uh, Wichita Falls and Nakona and how that name com came about. If you can touch on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the things that we, we study in local history are our place names and um you know i grew up in wichita county in, in the wichita falls area and i was always interested in where that name wichita came from originally and of course that's a, a major american indian group and uh, one of the the things that i ran across in, in my research is an expedition through the region in the 1840s and you it's a pretty good description of a what a wichita indian village looked like uh, which was actually located at what is now modern day Wichita Falls. So I think I'll just I'll read from the description here if that's okay. Uh, yeah. It's uh, so this is around the 1840s, mid 1840s. Uh, as you recall, during this time period, Texas is a republic. It's its own country. It's its own nation. It's uh, right from 1836 to 1846. It was the Republic of Texas. So the Republic of Texas wants to establish some kind of trading relationship with New Mexico with the folks in, in Santa Fe. They, they hope that there could be some kind of trade and commerce between Austin and, and Santa Fe. And so the president of Texas, I believe that's they had a president at this time, the president of Texas, <laughs> Marabou Lamar, <laughs> right? He sends a an expedition that way. And so it sends the expedition right through our part of Texas, right through North Central Texas. And uh, so it's a contingent of about 321 Texans they're mainly merchants and volunteers. They're mainly businessmen who want to establish these these ties with people in, in Santa Fe. So they call themselves the Santa Fe Pioneers. They they leave out with about twenty one ox drawn wagons carrying about two hundred thousand dollars worth of trade goods, and uh, so they're headed up through North Texas. They're, they come through the counties of, of modern day Wise, Montague, Clay, in Wichita County, near the modern day cities of Bowie, Henrietta, Dean. Wichita Falls and Iowa Park. And as they're going through these areas, uh, they run into a network of 
Wichita Indian villages. They, they basically stumbled upon this network of Indian villages. And the biggest network is at the, the wide expanse of the big Wichita River where present day Wichita Falls is, is today. And it's thought that there was about 500 people living in this, this village. Uh, it was near the confluence of, of Holiday Creek and the big Wichita River. And uh, what the Texans that discovered there is that the Indians had planted fields of pumpkins and corn and squash. In fact, they were shocked. There was a strip in one of the villages, one of the larger villages, that was a mile long by two miles wide. And you could see there that the, the Indians were, were cultivating corn, squash, pumpkins, and, and melons. Uh, these are you know pretty common crops that they would have grown at, at that time. And um, I think at the site of the lumbering Texans coming in on their village, the Wichita's escaped from the village. They, they basically went and kind of hid in the brush. And I think they probably went to, to hide their livestock so that the Texans didn't steal the livestock is, is what happened. So the, the Texans basically came up on this empty village and they were hungry. The Texans were, they were curious and they, they pillaged the, the empty huts. They stole their food items. And, um, and then they uh, basically, um, what, what's interesting though is here is that when at the Wichita village, you could see that the Wichita Indians were now using husbandry. They were raising livestock. Uh, so it was this kind of mix of hunting plus they're, they're raising livestock at the same time. Uh, so they're bringing in th these, these new te techniques to help them subsist in, in the area. Now, after rummaging through the village, these Texans, these so-called Santa Fe pioneers um, are, are looking around. Uh, they, they do find that the water is fresh in that area. So um, th that seems to be the reason why this village is here is because it's it's got fresh water in an area that has lots of salt water. And one of the captains in the expedition carves his name into a tree there. Later on, the town surveyors, the town founding fathers of Wichita Falls, they find Holiday uh, carved into a tree, and that's why they call that Holiday Creek. Unfortunately, we don't know what these Indians called that creek, and, and I wish that we did know what they called it because we would probably know more about how they use that creek because the the Indians and the way that they, they name things are very specific in, in terms of how that resource is being used. Uh, but we, we end up with the Appalachian Holiday Creek there. Um, so with those stolen goods, the Texans set off and uh, they think they're on the Red River, but they're actually on the Big Wichita River. And uh, so they're, they're mistaken in the, when you, when you go up the Big Wichita River, it basically breaks apart into arroyos on the state plains and they got lost. They, they, they were completely lost on the plains. And uh, eventually they, they stumble out onto the high plains where the Mexican authorities arrest them and force them to march across the deserts back to Mexico City where they, they spend a couple of years in prison. So this is into a disaster uh, for the Texans. Uh, but it, it's interesting because you get this brief glimpse of this Wichita Indian village that existed in what is now modern day Wichita Falls. So Wichita Falls, uh, of course, later on, uh, really gets gone about 1882, and the the founding fathers, right, know they they can see these signs of an Indian community, indigenous community that was there at that Holiday Creek in Wichita, where that comes together, and that's where present day Wichita Falls is is located. So, uh, you know, it's it's an ancient spot where where people had lived for for a very long time, and. Um, you know, that's the, the reason the day we, we call it Wichita Falls is because of that Wichita village that was in that exact same spot that Wichita Falls is today. Uh, now, the, the other one I wanted to mention just real quickly was Nakona. Uh, mm -hmm. Nakona is another American Indian name in our area of North Central Texas. It's named after Peta Nakona, who was a Comanche chief. He was actually uh, the, the headman of a the Kuwahata band. And uh, that's the same band, of course, as Quana Parker. In, in fact, Quana Parker is the son of Peter Nakona. And um, so this is a very famous incident. In December 1860, there was the Battle of Peace River. And that's where um, Cynthia Ann Parker was, was recaptured. She was um, a white woman who was taken from the frontier in 1836, but she had basically come to live as, as a Comanche. She had be become Comanche. And she had married Peter Nakona. That Peter Nakona was her husband, and they had had a child, uh, Quana Parker. In fact, she insisted uh, after being captured that she would wanted to stay with the Comanches, and she kind of died heartbroken later on. Um, she her younger child was with her prairie flower, 
and uh, so she and Prey Flower lived with uh, white folks, but uh, she would have preferred to have lived with Peter Nakona. Now, it's interesting. Sol Ross was the leader of this expedition that went after uh, Nakona, that, that, that found um, Cynthia Ann Parker. Uh, but Sol, Sol Ross claimed that Peter Nakona was killed in the in the battle. And uh, from what we can tell, it looks like Sol Ross made this up. Uh, so this is something interesting about American Indian history, right? It, it's often mythologized by whites. Uh, and and so you can see how that was done by Sol Ross here. He really turns the story more into a myth because uh, Peter Nakona wasn't killed. He wasn't killed that day. Quano Parker says that uh, Peter Nakona died several years later. But his he, kn he knew exactly where his father died and when, and it wasn't at the Battle of, of Peace River. Uh, so there's some interesting debate about how did Peter Nakona actually die. But uh, again, according to the Comanches and according to Quano Parker, he, he wasn't there at the Battle of Peace River. And it looks like, actually, that the Battle of Peace River wasn't much of a battle. In fact, it looks like... Uh, it was a raid on a camp of women and children for the most part, uh, because if Peter Nakona wasn't there, if he was one of the headmen and he wasn't even there, uh, it looks like this was just uh, a white militia that um, e found a, a lo easily located some women and children in a camp and raided them. And uh, so it wasn't really much of a, even a battle. So it was that's uh, Nakona is, is named after Peter Nakona. Right. And then, of course, Wichita Falls named after um the Wichita Indians in our area, and specifically the Wichita Indians at that village, they were uh, from what a band, I guess, is is the term that is often used. Is uh, they were a Waco uh, part of the, the Wichita. So there are other groups mm -hmm. like Tavoyas and uh, that were in the area, but the specific band uh, in Wichita Falls was a, a Waco uh, group. Uh, so oh. just a little bit on the place names there for you. <laughs> That's awesome. That's interesting how. <laughs> We think it's one thing and then come to find out it's totally different perspective, <laughs> like totally yeah. different. Right, right. Yeah, and it is, it's really a matter of perspective. That, that's that's important to remember. Um, Chester, can you talk about um, the Navajo approach to learning the culture and culture meaning like Navajo culture and uh, the United States culture, or I don't know what the term is, how you would define it. And then also uh, balancing life on or near reservations. Okay. Um, the the uh, majority of the Navajo out there they don't they don't um, they don't really know their their clan structure and they really don't know the some of the teachings uh, because those teachings are basically kept with the with the healer with the medicine person. And the people inter interact with that medicine person, and then while you're going through the ceremony, they don't give you a class and and how this works. They're just doing a healing ceremony to get you well. So if you grow up in a in a in a medicine man or medicine woman culture, then you're taught all the things about the earth, air, the fire, water, the four directions, the deities. Um, the seasons, how it all flows together. And um, when you're experiencing that kind of thing and you you come to this much more linear approach to life, you know, goal A, goal B, go over there, do this, do that. It's this very, it's, a, it, it's not circular, it's more linear. So when it's linear, it, it's harder for the, for the, I've heard this before said by, by researchers, for the Indian mind to wrap their head around it because it's it's very linear and it's very logical and it's very it's got a lot of logic and rationale behind it about why i have to learn the abcs and the one two threes and uh, why i have to pledge allegiance to the flag every day um why i have to remember john three sixteen. i mean there's all these things that that are very you have to do this and you're gonna get tested on it whereas indian culture and the, 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 the navajo culture it's done on how you how you approach your your prayers and how you approach your daily life. So when you're talking from from the aspect of I'm gonna I'm gonna start my prayer here right now. I'm gonna pray here to the east, to the south, to the west, to the north, to the Mother Earth and Father Sky, and I'm gonna pray to those deities in those directions. And then I'm gonna invoke the the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, and the Heavenly Father God. And at that moment, once you do that. It makes the it makes the Christian and the ceremony relax, 
and it makes the rest of the people in there that are practicing the traditional culture ways go okay he knows the deities he knows the way so when you when you approach it that way all of a sudden it, you're now you're now using the words and the names of these of these places and you're actually pushing the energy through it and that's what starts the the flow of the ceremony mm-hmm. so so that so the language is really important so when when I when I when I used to give classes on this stuff, I used to talk in Navajo and then explain it in English. So one of the things was What I'm talking about is I'm talking about the teachings and the, the methodologies of the Navajo of the holy people on earth that are the Navajo. So when you say it in a Navajo way, it, if there's another Navajo sitting in the room. They're gonna get you. They're gonna know. That that man knows about about our ways. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna continue coming over and spending time with them because he might share some some other stuff. So anytime that I was involved in ceremony, um, my relatives used to say, "Okay, pay attention. You're in class now. <laughs> you got to watch what what the people are doing in front of you, and you kind of have to copy them." to to make it go in, in in a certain way and and then and then when it comes time if you want to sing yeah you can sing but remember you, you got you got a there's certain songs that the, the the healer sings there's certain songs that certain people sing you stay away from those they, you you use your own so there's some songs that i had to learn as a, as a kid uh, that i would sing primarily children's song because i was a child when i first engaged in this so I would sing children's songs, and and then there was another song that had that had the word J J J. So J is is a is an expression of of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So so since they couldn't say Jesus, they just say J. And then and then the word is Dahina Jesus Dahina, which is which is he is still alive. So that's used in, in some of the ceremonies. So when when I'm when I'm learning this and I'm kind of kind of going through the Christian faith and and then still practicing my culture, it was kind of like okay, um, okay, I can feel it flowing now, and it's making a little more sense in my head. We're no longer living this dichotomy. <laughs> I'm no longer living in two worlds. I'm living in one world together, whereas before I was living in two worlds because it was separate. So when it when it was separate, it was a lot harder. It was a lot more confusing. Life didn't flow as good. There was all kind of things in the way because the mind and the body and the spirit weren't, weren't, weren't aligned and flowing together from from inside of you with with the environment that, you, that you're in. So the environment that that um, I grew up in, there there is a the way the structure of the earth is is a sand sandstone with hard 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 red rock. And in those veins, there's uh, crystals that are in the veins, and that that's where my father's um, ceremonial house sat was right on top of that. So there were certain things that were happening there that I didn't see anywhere else, and so I'm like, well, this is environmental. This is this is a connection with the with the earthways, and and it, this. So now I understand why people want certain parts and certain land, certain land masses. So Navajo land, Navajo, we can still ask for those that we want, but then as American Indians, there's certain there's certain buttes that we would like to have access to, but we're not allowed to. <laughs> okay, so so we'd like to use those buttes to to send up the prayers to help bring about the healing, but but we can't, we're not allowed to do it. Um, in nineteen, I think it was ninety four October. Uh, Clinton signed into law the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, um, which further moved forward the 1972-1978 Freedom Act to allow me to uh, to carry this around without having any any repercussions. So I could carry this around on I could put this on my on my desk in, in CTC and uh, use it just to kind of make myself you know. Get all the stuff off of me from the last conversation I had with the with the student. That's kind of what this is for, just to get off those those heebie-jeebies or whatever. 
So this is this is something that um, that is uh, that's given to us to a, a human being uh, that that has that has done something to help the community. So they just don't they just don't just give it out just 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 to give it out. Um, so that's the that's the part that I think in terms of the learning the culture is if you know how to engage the the prayers if you know how to operate yourself with inside these ceremonies then 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 they're going to come to you and say hey come on over be be part of our be part of our next ceremony and and oh, sorry i have two questions so okay. before clinton signed that um law was it okay for people to carry that around or in, was that something that was frowned upon or like in, in 1978 we were actually allowed to carry our regalia in our cars to go to powwows to go to ceremonies so it was in 72 to 78 where you if you were caught praying with that in in, in a park you couldn't <laughs> you couldn't yeah oh wow but but if you're on the reservation and you're praying in your own park on the reservation no problem so so the so a majority of the people that group that live in and around Navajo and Flagstaff and Gallup and Farmington and Cortez and uh, Monticello, the border towns, P Page, Arizona. Some of them know. Some of them understand that that yeah, this is this is this is allowed. They're not hurting anybody. They're just praying. They're praying over their food, or they're praying for someone's birthday, or or something. You know. So it's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing that that we need to 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 take offense to. Um, so I'm also reading the, the chat and that was something that I was thinking too. And someone said the first amendment does not apply to native Americans. So like the right to religion, you know, does not apply to native Americans. It's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> like, like, yeah, we were, we were, we were given the, we were given the freedom. We were, and, um. Uh, if you go back onto the reservation, yeah, we practice it freely. But you come out down here to Dallas, Texas, and you try to do a prayer in the middle, uh, it's not going to fly. Um, you try to to do a prayer at a powwow, yeah, because Indians are gathered, no problem. But if I'm going to try to do a prayer inside the 2100 building at CTE um, in my own private way with the door closed, that's my right. But if I'm going to drag you three in on it, and we're going to sit down and have a quote-unquote powwow, mm -mm. frowned upon. Can I ask you how um, you were? I mean, I don't know. If, do I call it a feather? Like I'm not like. How yeah, are you given? Okay. That, that's an eagle feather. Um, how were you presented? Or I don't even know if I can ask how you were presented with the feather because you said. This feather was given to me after I had um, I had uh, helped a family with um, with a sickness, um, kind of like a kind of like a possession mm -hmm. um, that that there was something in something on the person, and any time they started invoking the spirit, this this uh, this thing would take over, and uh, so I, ha I happened to be in the area, and, and I happened to to. Um, I knew the prayers and the songs on on on. on you gotta go like, hey buddy, come with me. You don't want to be in there anymore. Come, <laughs> you're free. Go this way, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> Which is basically kind of what you're saying. And but you don't do it. You don't do it out of out of wrath or you want it to die or anything. You just you just take it out and just set it on its way. With the power of the Holy Spirit, you see, it's not me doing it. So this this eagle feather, actually makes it easier to do mm -hmm. those things without me forcing myself without me forcing my hand and my will because it, it's the spirit it's the spirit of god that does the healing so mm -hmm. that's how i came upon this was the family member after they got some healing and they they lived in harmony for four years and they were back on the up and up and they happened to be with some family members in, in south dakota and that that was given to them and they said, oh, we're going to give this to Chester. And I was like, wow, that's cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yep. 
So that's my um, pers- that's my personal one. I-, I have others that are in other boxes that are that are for the community. Was there any other things that you had to balance? So like you couldn't really do that off the reservation. Was there anything else that you couldn't really do off the reservation that you learned? Um, there are certain, uh, certain things like when I was living in Flagstaff and living in Phoenix, um, I can do prayers for people in their houses, no problem. But if I was to do it outside in a public area, mm-hmm. like for example, if I was at a powwow, I could do it, no problem. And I've done it before at the powwows where, where some people will say, hey, you know, can you can you pray for the ground? So I'll be like, yeah, sure, I can do that. And 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 so when you when when it's like that, it's easier because now it's now it's kind of bona fide and, and protected. But but there's certain things that I knew that when I was in college, there's certain things I couldn't do because I don't want to bring attention to myself. But when someone dreams about you. That I had a dream about you, that um, that you're you you're the one that can do a prayer for me, and and I can get this thing off of me that it's been following me around since I was thirteen. When someone tells you that, and that you had the same dream, mm-hmm. that that's Holy Spirit talking. So mm-hmm. I don't I don't have any 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 qualms about that. And then I just go, well, it's just it's just going to be. They think it's going to be some huge, long, outgiven. You know, we're gonna. <laughs> it's just getting some water, doing a little prayer for the water, using the fan, putting a little um, what do they call that corn pollen on them. Okay. That's it. It's just nothing. It's 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 the prayer that goes in the water, mm-hmm. and and y'all know about that. The scientists have know about that, but that's that's the one that that does that does the. The, the freeing of that spirit. So, so there's certain things that I was asked to do when I was in college. Part of that was talk like this, gives give uh, information about about the uh, the four directions, about the Mother Earth, the Father Sky, how we relate to it, and then um, certain laws that apply. And then uh, when I was in graduate school, I got to talk a little more about it <clears throat> in terms of some of the things that that I was able to experience, and I interviewed uh, ten medicine men um, for my thesis, and was able to get their thoughts on the leadership qualities of principles in Arizona and what they thought was important. They thought all of the qualities that the vice principals and the principals were using were all important except for one thing: written communication. They're like, we don't, we don't write things. It's all, it's all in here. And it's all in here. There's no <laughs> oral communication, organizational, you know, clarity, you know, communication, all of that, you know, everything, organizational ability, following the path, you know, all of those things are really important. But when it came to written communication, they're like, uh, no, we don't, we don't write letters. <laughs> so it's, it was pretty interesting. Definitely. And, and, and then there's there's times like this when when I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was asked to to play the flute and then give a little just a little brief five minute presentation on um, what it means to be Diné, what it means to be Navajo, and uh, sharing that. Um, so today I was talking about the further you get away from your homeland, your home country. The further you get away from the from the source and 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 the, and the the power, it's associated with that with that environment. So, in 2011, I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, from the from the reservation, and then lived there till till 2018, and then moved here with my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, her family is from Louisville and Flower Mound. So so when we moved here. Um, all this stuff that I have, I have, I don't know how many more blankets I have and all the stuff that, that we were using with my family was all given to me. So now I'm like, okay, uh, every, every season I have to take them out <laughs> so they can stretch. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility. It, it's, it's, it's a uh, one I don't take lightly. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And then 
we'll talk a little bit about life after the reservation. Um, but I want to talk about uh, local indigenous influence. Dr. Anderson, can you touch on that? Yeah, I think it's one of the things that that really gets overlooked, and I think Chester's really uh, hitting it home. I, I think a lot of people, um, I guess white folks in general, they they think American Indian history is it's happened and it, it's all in the past. You know, it's it's, but it isn't. It's uh, the American Indian culture is still thriving today, and it's thriving in our own area. Uh, you can you can definitely see it in southwestern Oklahoma. It's uh, the Comanche Kiowas, the the Kiowa Apache up there are. Uh, they have thriving cultures. They have a thriving economy, especially with uh, the whole gaming that that's going on now. As Chester and I were talking earlier about, uh, around 2000, right? Uh, the, the gaming came in, and um, it's you know what it's interesting too is is when you um, actually get on on the ground and and talk with uh, American Indian people with Comanches, uh, you you really you, you learn a lot about their cultures and. Um, it's, you know, when I went up and, and did some interviews, I, I learned a lot about fancy dancing. I, I had no idea what fancy dancing was, and it's 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 amazing. Right? The, the powwow culture is 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 amazing. And I'm curious. I want to ask Chester some questions myself. Uh, you know, is, is it okay for um, people in in North Central Texas, white folks, that to go to a powwow? And you know, is 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 that acceptable? And also, I'm curious too about how has COVID affected the powwows? Is that um, are we social distancing at, at powwows, or how, how how does that how does that changed? And, and you know, it's 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 interesting that um, you know, growing up in Wichita Falls, you would see uh, people driving around, and they would have Comanche drivers license plates. You know that they're um, you know that they have their their own cultures, their own identities, their own nations, their own set of laws, and they're here among us. It's it's not that those cultures are from some bygone era. I think that is, um, it, they're, they're living, breathing cultures. And even you can see it with the way the the proceeds from the Comanche uh, casinos, the profits, for example, the way that those are shared are, are shared uh, in a similar way that the Comanches would have shared resources in the 1800s, right? Communally, they're, um, they're on the rolls, that they're shared. The profits are shared equally among the, the tribal members that are on the rolls. It's um, so, you know, you you would think. I guess some people think that some of these practices are are um, a, again a bygone era that they, they don't exist anymore. But they're alive. They're well. They're um, those cultures are like I said, thriving in, in many cases more more than you would you would realize. Uh, now there are of course issues uh you know especially on on some reservations so you know i think of the, the dakotas for example right and in those areas um uh, but it, it's it's you know the, the influence that, that i was talking about were those those place names um you you see that the influence of indigenous cultures on our the, on the in the places that we live in, in wichita falls and nakona so you you see it historically there uh but it, it's not just that it's, it's just not a a, a relic of the past, right? The, these um, these American Indian cultures are alive and well today. So I want, I think that's what I have to say about the the influence there. Speaking a little bit on the history, and um, I know you mentioned that you interviewed a, a Comanche as well. Um, so we did have a question come in. So don't you think that not having written recorded history directly? Uh, from the Native Americans allows for non-Indigenous people to write your story, and I think that kind of touches on both of your your and your previous comments. Yeah, I think uh, too. I think that's an important uh, point. I think, uh, as Chester was saying, it does seem to be that American Indian culture is, is more experiential, like that you you experience it than necessarily recording it down. But there. There are records. You you do get the American Indian voices. If you go back into the historical primary source documents, you can go, for example, to the Jerome Commission, and you can see the American Indian resistance to the Jerome Commission. You can they speak through translators, so you have to be careful, right? Uh, but uh, you can see it in the historical sources. It's there, and if you, if you go and interview um, Comanches, Wichita's today, uh, Kiowas, they're they're really open and and well. Um, you know, talk to you about 
important issues. Uh, and when I went up in the early 2000s, I went up to do some interviews to see how the gaming was going and if what kind of impact it was having. And um, they were very open with how the, the, the proceeds were being shared and uh, the, the kind of fight they were experiencing with the people from Oklahoma City who were, uh, they, they wanted, um, basically they were making lots of money off of horse racing in, in Oklahoma City and they didn't want to have to compete with the American Indian casinos. And uh, so they were, you know, it was, they'll definitely tell you how, the, how they're feeling and, and what the, uh, you know, what problems and, and issues they're, they're facing today. Uh, and in the past, I mean, they, the same thing, right? Um, the American Indians, for example, when they were going to build Fort Sill, um, the, the government made this argument that, well, um, this land isn't worth anything, right? Because it's in the mountains. There's just a bunch of stone up here. And the American Indians will said, well, I noticed that you build houses with the stone, right? So the stone is worth <laughs> something, right? And I've noticed too, that they find gold and silver in these hills. So that gold and silver is, is worth something. right? so the, the American Indians were putting up a resistance and you can certainly see it in the documentation, historical documentation from, from the time. Um, but yeah, I think it does. Um, there, there's just some things you can't learn though from the documents, right? I, I think there's, there's some things, especially about the, the spiritual geography as, as Chester is, is describing. Right. I think those, especially the, the medicine men and the, the teachings of the medicine men and um, those things that you can only experience, I don't know that you can learn that necessarily from a from a book. So going back to the powwows and the spiritual connection, is it okay for a non-Indigenous person to go to a powwow? Yes, we had, a, when I was in Phoenix, Arizona, I was part of a, a it was called the Arizona Territory Gourd Society. And the guy, the Gore Society primarily honors veterans and their families. Uh, so I became a member of that um, back in 2000, and I think it was 10. And then um, soon after that, I was made, um, I was an officer called the Whitman. And the Whitman of the Gore Society is the one that makes sure that uh, everyone's dressed appropriately, everyone has got the right regalia on for the Gore dance. And uh, there was sometimes there were things that were enforced, no pictures, um, no recordings, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but when the when the flags come in, when the flags come in and the grand entry happens, you, then then you can ask to take pictures of some of the dancers. Just don't just start you know taking pictures. You just you can go up there and ask them, introduce yourself, find out who they are, and then take a picture of them or with them. And they're 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 most of them are very open. They're very, very open to it. They want to help teach. They want to help share, uh, especially uh, the athletes, the fancy dancers of the athletes, for sure. So, yeah. So what is a fancy dan dancing? Uh, what is fancy that? dancing uh, came about in the 70s. Um, before that, there was no powwows that, that anyone could ever remember. It, it came out of this this movement called the American Indian Movement to celebrate your culture, to um, – to reconnect to the earth, to reconnect to your ceremonial ways. Because a lot of these people were urban Indians living in Minneapolis, San Francisco, all these kind of places. And they they got together and they they started, you know, creating these things. And people started really having pride in in being an American Indian. Whereas before that, he, most of the people that I that I grew up around had flat tops wearing you know, floor shine shoes, you know, they were all driving Studebakers and <laughs> I mean, it was all it was all American culture, you know. To the, and then at some point it kind of shifted to, you know, hey, it's it's cool to be Indian, you know, let's be Indian. But um, all of the powwows um, that were scheduled from March all the way through next spring have all been canceled. So there is no there is no gathering of any type. So I did see um, on doing some research, I think it was powwows.com um, yep. or that one or gathering of the nations.com. Those, those are the had, same. Oh, oh, okay. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, they had some virtual entries. So like, I guess there's competitions that go on and they had some virtual entries. Mm -hmm. So then my other question is um, watching them. I I did notice that there's a Miss Indian World competition. Mm -hmm. yes. Did that come about from that movement of wanting to be, wanting to come back, but like showing off your own heritage, I guess you could say? So kind of yeah. like a United States thing and then merging yes. into yes. one's culture. Yes, there's, there's, um, 
there's three elements. The first element is where you came from, your regalia, your language, your culture, um, how that how that makes you who you are, your identity, um, and then how you're balancing that in, in the two worlds, and then what talent you're going to share. Some of them they'll sing a song, some of them will will grind grind corn, some of them will 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 do a show show some tapestry that they've learned some beadwork uh, so there's all these things that they share within within their culture but most of it comes down to to how close they are to their to their upbringing because of mm -hmm. all those of all those that have gone through some of them some of them are are from different nations throughout the united states and canada so they they all get to to share their culture and they get to do it as eloquently as possible uh, so with their in, in their own language and then and then sharing it with 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 English, so it's a uh, it's um we used to dance with those people that that uh, that uh, were the the directors of the Gathering of Nations and and they used to come down and spend time with us in Mesa Arizona uh, when we used to uh, sponsor our our gourd dance down there before the powwow started. So moving on to like life after the reservation, how do you maintain your culture and your language? I do it probably once a week where I will say my prayers, um, usually in the morning um, before the sun comes up. Sometimes I'll take out my corn pollen bag and do a prayer. Um, sometimes I'll just use the eagle feather and do a prayer. But it's primarily just maintaining that for myself, and, and in terms of of my family, the home that we're in, the earth, the air, the fire that's around the home, and uh, the things that we're doing as a family. So it's all very, it's kind of an integral part of who we are, in terms of how we practice it. Um, primarily, do it for ourselves, but um, the the connections and the prayers and the songs. Um, I try to do the songs uh, quarterly, so fall, spring, summer, um, usually as close to the solstice as I can. So, do you have children of your own? Do you have a child? Nope. No. Okay. Nope. Okay. Yes, sir. Can I ask? Uh, does the the flute playing does that play a role uh, in practicing the cultural elements? Yeah, the the flute came came from uh, came from the the northeast, um, kind of the the river. The lake people are the ones that, that that shared that with the with the the rest of the people after they started spreading through the powwows, and uh, some of the things that that the flute was used for was the young man to to lure a woman, young woman, that she that he wanted to be with, but you know she was with the strongest, toughest, most you know horse beating guy in the world with the long, long, beautiful hair that you see on those Harlequin Harlequin books, you know. <laughs> so so. Uh, so this this uh, young man, he went out and got a flute, and he made the flute. And he started copying copying sounds of the rivers and sounds of birds, and so he started playing that. And and she she got curious, and she came, and and they met each other, and they were able to to in get introduced to the family. He got introduced to the family, and they got to share. And next thing you know, you know, grandkids now for sure. <laughs> so. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I've listened to some uh, Dr. Nevikoya. Uh, he's a Comanche flautist. Do, do you have any recommendations on, uh, are there any artists that we should be listening to in terms of, you know, American Indian flute playing? Um, I don't know of any right now. Back in the day, there was a guy named Carlos Nakai. Okay, Carlos Nakai. Yeah, Carlos Nakai was uh, very, very famous. He he lived in a town not too far from my college town. I that I went to Durango. Uh, I think he lived in Mancus, so he was he became uh, quite renowned, uh, world famous for sure. I'll have to check him out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other places that you feel like you could recommend to like learn more or? Yeah, I would definitely would go on to um, Google anything that has to do with powwow. Um, Oh, well, I think there's a website up there it's from California. It's about the gourd dance, and it talks about rules and protocols. Um, if you're going to go to 
to a to a powwow. Um, you want to make sure you stay outside the circle. Don't want to go inside the circle. Um, there's certain things that, that you can't have: alcohol, tobacco. You can't have drugs, alcohol. Um, so so, and there are there are men there. There's not necessarily a police force that's there, but there are men there that that um, stand beside the drum and that, that that keep that drum by itself from the rest of the people. So so there's a lot of protocol. Um, most of it is just you know you just kind of watch what other people are doing. And one thing you don't want to do is let your little kid run right straight through that power ground. <laughs> They'll be like, whose kid is that? <laughs> um, I'll recommend in our local area, if you, if you ever have the chance, make that trip up the lot in Oklahoma. It's only about an hour or two from, you know, from the north central Texas area. And go to the Comanche National Museum and Cultural Center. They have a really nice uh, cultural center there. I, I learned a lot when I was I was there last time. And also right next to it is the uh, Museum of the Great Plains. So they're, they're both stacked right there together. So you know, as the COVID restrictions and things lift, maybe in the yep. future, that that's a, a really interesting place uh, to to visit. That's a good like, little nice day trip right there. Yeah, go, up, go to the Wichita Mountains and check out the museums up there around Lot, and you can. You can learn a lot about American Indian culture up there. Awesome. Was there anything that y'all wanted to touch on or say before we wrap this up? Maybe that's something you didn't get to say. Uh, Navajo Navajo culture. Whenever we finish things, we 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 say in beauty it is finished. Wajina hustling, wajina hustling. That's that's how in beauty it is finished. So that we just kind of go in a nice, cool kind of yeah, enjoy my evening now. I love it. Awesome. <laughs> I can't end it any better than that. That was awesome. I know, right? <laughs> I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all so much. A uh, shout out to the awareness team for putting this together. Really yep. appreciate both of y'all taking the time to um, talk. And, and Chester, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks. Um, if you want to wrap it up again, because I like went in and talked, <laughs> feel free. Yep. So, hold you not hustling, hold you not hustling, hold you not hustling. Beauty is finished, and beauty is finished, and beauty is finished. Thanks. <laughs>